Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's call. My name is Shalitha Smodek, and I am a private wealth advisor at Westwood. And my name is Jason Karras, and I'm also a private wealth advisor at Westwood. Jason and I will be serving as your moderators today as we discuss tips on how you can protect your digital asset with Brad Boother. Brad Boother is a seasoned IT professional that's currently serving as the team lead of systems engineering and desktop support here at Westwood. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Awesome. So as technology and the internet are increasingly weaved into our everyday lives, what are some of the dangers that you are seeing arise? And what types of questions do you think that people should be asking themselves when thinking through how to protect themselves online? Well, one of the things we see is that a lot of people that are obviously, you know, Still, still working uh, that are out there. Um, as everybody has gone back to working remotely, there's a lot of paranoia around. You know, how do I secure my household? It's it's not going to be near as secure as our work environment is. Uh, a lot of people were throwing these notions out on uh, all types of media as everyone you know moved to a work from home solution. And you know, at the end of the day, the reality is nobody is going to park outside of your house. And try and hack into your local uh, your local Wi-Fi on your house. Uh, the the payoff is next to nothing. It's not worthwhile. Uh, you're more likely to be attacked unknowingly uh, by by a bad actor who has then already attacked one of your friends. Uh, this is most likely where these things are going to happen. These things uh, happen in the simplest of ways. Uh, you have friends visit in your home, you have Wi-Fi, you don't have a guest network, you have one Wi-Fi network for everyone and you allow them to connect to your Wi-Fi. Nothing happens maybe this time, next time they come back, well, their phone still knows what your Wi-Fi password is, they connect, but in the meantime, their devices have been, been accessed and now they've gotten back in and they've accessed your entire network. They can see every computer, every device in your house, and then that damage can propagate to every single other device. Um, you can be your own worst enemy. Uh, it's that simple. Thanks for that, Brad. Um, you know, now that we talked about some of the dangers that are out there, um, let's take a little talk a little bit more about cyber hygiene. Um, two of the most obvious areas that come to my mind are personal security and mobile device security. Um, when it comes to internet browsing at home, what are the most common types of equipment used and what are some of the issues we should be aware of when using that equipment? Well, everybody usually, they have a, an internet service provider or ISP for short. Uh, the, they usually supply your own equipment. Uh, people that are picky like me, we, we get our own equipment. We don't trust anyone else's. But uh, you generally have at the minimum a modem uh, if you have DSL or cable. Uh, that supplies possibly an only only a single point of access. Uh, many of the modems often offer Wi-Fi nowadays. Uh, normally, what you get from most providers is a modem that is also a router. It has at least usually four physical connections on there. But once again, it has a built-in Wi-Fi. Uh, most people uh, don't think about it. They use the Wi-Fi that's on there. Uh, you also have you can add additional pieces. Uh, like separate access points, which would just mean you're using the, instead of using Wi-Fi that would be uh, built into the router they supplied you with, you could create your own Wi-Fi, or you could add Wi-Fi extenders, uh, which do, do nothing more than take that same signal and extend it a little further to cover areas of your house where it's not covered, especially if you're, you know, your modem router Wi-Fi points are all much farther away. Um, and so the biggest problem with these pieces of equipment is uh, most people never think that they need to be updated for one. Um, they, all of them uh, have vulnerabilities. You know, the, the modem slash router is the first point that's physically connected to the outside world. Um, and one of the things with those is they do have uh, regular updates because they have vulnerabilities on them. Um, something you should check quarterly. They also by default, all of them come with a default password and anybody can find out the model you have, look it up, and they're going to get the default password. If you haven't changed that, you can be vulnerable because they also have remote access. Remote access 
is something you would want to turn off because if people can find your modem remotely, then all they have to do is look up the model, get the base serial number, the base, you know, login name and, and password. If you haven't changed it, they then access that piece of equipment. You know, the, the probability of this, like I said, for a local home user, it, it, the payoff is, is, is light, uh, to be honest but it's not uncommon to, to have happened. You also, when they supply you with these, they have, uh, wi like I said, Wi-Fi that's often built into them. They have it printed often on the side what the SSID is and what the password is. These are things that you want to change. So, you know, you should, if you're going to use the SSID that was built into it, change the password so that it doesn't match what's printed on there. Uh, anybody can walk in and find that. And if you have children, that's the biggest one because all their friends come in, they know how it works. They don't even tell you, they ask their front, they ask your kids or they just walk in, they find where it is and they read that information right off the side. And now they're connected on your network and you didn't even know they were there. And who knows what they've been, you know, where they've been, uh, what they may have picked up or what nefarious plans they may even have, who knows. Um, we all know we have kids that some friends we don't trust, uh, and we shouldn't trust them on our networks. So, you know, passwords, firmware, uh, hiding your SSID and not broadcasting. And, and that's, that's what, you know, when you're looking at Wi-Fi and you pull up a list of Wi-Fi, those, that's what the SSID is, is that name of that network. Don't broadcast it. Turn it off. Uh, you can find that information in the manual. Uh, look it up. It usually takes five minutes to figure that out. Well, those are some great tips, Brad. Thanks. So what about our smart devices it seem to be in every home these days? Things like Google Home, Amazon Echo, Ring doorbells, Nest thermostats. What do we need to keep in mind when using these? Well, this goes, so this kind of goes in into two places. Um, so one of the things we hadn't talked about yet is, is your Wi-Fi at home. And like I said, you can hide that SSID. What is re recommended and highly recommended, many of the newer ones today have a separate guest network. Uh, and the reason you want that guest network is, is, is not, it is completely separate from your Wi-Fi that you're using, but it's, it's segmented on a different network, meaning that once they're connected, they're only connected to that one source. They can't see your personal computers, uh, your personal devices, if you have them on your personal network. Don't give out that information. Don't share that. Let them have a guest connection. And that goes with the smart devices. So these smart devices are connected as well. Uh, and all they really need to do is they're getting out to the internet. They're talking to some cloud service provider and moving, moving data in between them and that. And that's all they're seeing. They don't need to see anything on. So often it's best to have these devices if you can do it. And it, it, it's not for everyone. A, a, another separate network. So honestly, running three wireless networks. And the reason that is, is these devices Often they're supposed to be updated, but they can be compromised. And if they're compromised and they're on the same network as yours, then, then they have access to listen to you. And, and granted, the technology on these is well done, but people are constantly trying to figure out how to crack that. And you, once they do, you won't know about it for many months beyond. So the, there's all kinds of information they can garner from you from these devices, just the echoes in the Google Home alone, if someone actually was able to access your network and get on these devices, they could then listen to everything you're saying. It's not impossible. It has been done in, in limited things and it takes a lot of access that most people can't get from you. But like I said, it's, it's an effect where, oh, here comes this kid did this and he didn't know his device was already and he's now He's now picked up something at his house that he spread to you, but now they've connected your Wi-Fi and they're now spreading it to the devices in your house. Uh, and that's how it happens. That's the easiest way for these things to occur. That's good. That's good info. And I always hear, you know, Google and Amazon are listening. You know, is that true? Or, you know, how is this data and info being used? And are there really many precautions we can take? Unfortunately, there's there's not a lot. If you choose to have these devices, you accept the fact that they do listen to you. They have privacy policies that regularly change, but there have been limited instances where the entire information that was recorded by these devices 
was grabbed up and then accidentally sent to someone halfway across the world. Now, if that can happen simply by a glitch in their system, you can imagine how many people are trying to figure out a way to actually get that information. And once they're listening to you, and, it's, and it's, keep in mind, it's not just these. Uh, a perfect example, it happened to me, and I've shared this with many people. I did not realize that Facebook was listening to me on my iPhone. I had not turned it off. It is on by default. And I only found out because of a very odd conversation. I was watching Jimmy Fallon, and they were making a joke about fake blood. And it was funny. And I mentioned the word fake blood several times that night before going to bed to my wife. The next morning when I got up, later in that morning, I looked at Facebook and I was immediately advertised fake blood. And I wondered, why would that be showing up now? It was listening to me and it had chosen advertisement. Keep in mind, those devices, whether you realize or not, they have a microphone. They can be listening. Check your apps. See what's listening to you. It will tell you, but you have to look for it. Well, those are good tips. Thanks, Brad. Um, moving on to our our home computers and our phones, you know, what are the most important considerations when using these devices? Well, these devices are, you know, a little bit more than what they used to be uh, in the past, uh, especially our phones. We we think about them as, but I'll start with the computers. So simple things is that a lot of people nowadays have laptops uh, and they have desktops as well. Um, most common operating systems are Windows and Mac OS after that. Uh, both of these, by default, offer something that is not turned on, which is file encryption. So the entire drives can be encrypted, uh, and they can only be read as long as they, may, they number one, uh, get a login with a valid password, and the drives stay physically attached inside the computer because there's a component in there, and we'll get into details, that, rec that the drive recognizes, and if it can't get a recognition back from that, it will not unencrypt the drive. Well, what's good about that is if you were to lose your laptop, if someone can't ac access with the password, their next thing to be would to take the drive physically out of the machine and scour that drive for information. But if it's encrypted, they're not going to get your information. Uh, another, another large one is um, backups. A lot of people don't think about backing up their home computers right up until the point where they lose 15 to 20 years worth of personal pictures of family pictures that you know, everybody feels are priceless. They never realize, well, we've got all these digital images on here and we never backed them up and the drive just crashed. Uh, and there, there are several options out there. Uh, most of them are paid, but you have a choice whether you want to back up the entire computer so you can restore it, from, restore it to a new computer in that case, or just back up the files. Uh, that's the recommended one. Uh, there are lots of good options. Uh, for that, and none of them are terribly expensive. And the great thing about that, when you're backing up to a cloud as opposed to a physical device in your house, you have those anywhere you go. So you can log into that service, whether it's on your phone or some other computer. Oh, I needed to grab this file, or I want to show somebody this picture. Here, I've got a copy right here. I don't have my device, but there it is. Um, that can be handy as well, just to have. Um, on these devices, always make sure that you're running the updates. So there have been People saying, oh, well, I never update the, uh, my iOS device, my, my iPhone, I don't update it right away. Well, the problem is the reason they're updating it is there's vulnerabilities. So, and the vulnerabilities don't just affect the OS. So the applications and people, you know, there are millions in these stores and you never know which application is necessarily, uh, necessarily needs to be updated. And often they will only update it for the latest OS. So until you update your, you update the OS on the phone as well, you may not be getting the latest update of an application. And so you may be vulnerable in multiple places. Um, it always, always pays to make sure you're up to date on all your software. Uh, on your computers, you should always make sure you have your personal firewall is never disabled. It is always turned on by default, but sometimes people will turn it off or worse, uh, the firewall uh, gets turned off. Uh, this was a common attack about 10 years ago where the antivirus, uh, or some virus would get on your machine and it would attack specific types of antivirus, the most popular ones, and it would disable them and turn off the firewall so that your computer was left, uh, you were thinking it was protected, it was completely unprotected. Uh, those things tend to rear their ugly head again. And the, and the personal firewall is just an extension of the physical one uh, that is on your uh, modem or router. It's just another layer of protection. And we always talk about, 
in my business, we talk about layers. The, the more layers you have, so something fails, something else picks up along the way. Uh, your passwords. Uh, password security is, is, is a mixed bag. Uh, passwords uh, are inherently bad to begin with. Uh, never count on just a password. But you should never, you should also have better password uh, hygiene. Never leave, never use local sports teams, uh, your kids' high schools. Any information you put out on social media, the name of your pets, places you go to, places where you have a vacation home, these are things that are easily found out about you, whether you realize it or not, because people are putting out there and they use these things in their passwords. Um, you should also rotate them regularly. Uh, make sure you change the change your passwords uh, regularly, at least you know once a quarter. Create yourself a reminder to do these things, as well as add a reminder that update your firmware and check for updates on all your machines, just to be proactive. Um, any physical devices like your old hard drives and machines or USB sticks, if you don't have those encrypted uh, with BitLocker or FileVault for Mac OS, make sure you destroy those, and I mean physically break them. Um, that data is any data can be recovered. You know, you throw it in the garbage, somebody digs through and next thing you know, they're finding information. Magnets are great on old physical hard drives, but most, uh, most ones don't actually have spinning platters anymore and magnets don't do any good. Make sure you break them. Uh, always lock your devices when you walk away. I don't know how many times in, 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 I walk by and see some computer completely unlocked. They're not at the computer. It only takes about 30 seconds to get some really good information. You can walk right over there and do whatever because you know, have, you're, you're already logged in, no password. It's great. Um, and you know, lastly, and not everybody does it, but uh, I'm just as guilty, pirated software. And if somebody doesn't want to pay for something or they don't want to, they, they, they go to a website to download movies illegally. Uh, they know about these. And so these, uh, these sites are often infested with a, a lot of malware. So even though you're not actually doing anything, you, you may be researching, you'd be surprised how quickly your machine can be infected or taken over uh, because you clicked on a couple little things and didn't realize it. Uh, there's hidden things that they, they overlay on the screen. So as soon as you click anywhere on the screen, uh, it, it kicks in a, another window that could be a pop-up, uh, fools you into certain things. Uh, those are some great tips. Thank you. So digging deeper into our use of the home computers and, of course, our phones, I mean, what do we need to know about staying safe when, when browsing the Internet you know, or using the apps on our phone? Well, the, the biggest thing is, is the majority of people, you know, for what they're doing, they're surfing the Internet. Um, they're you know, looking up things or they have using software as a service, which are just you know, applications where you're paying somebody that they're hosting something else. That could be your email or it could be your uh, files that you keep in a cloud. Uh, and, and that's really all there was. And so the, the biggest thing was is the biggest thing you're accessing this with browsers. N over 90% of all internet traffic uh, goes through an uh, internet browser. Uh, the best thing you can check for is if you look and every single one of them has them, look for the little lock. If you're not seeing a closed lock, you're on a non-secure site. Um, and you never, ever want to enter any information or fill out any kind of form on a site that is not secure, number one. Number two, uh, when they're insecure, so what happens is the browser says, okay, this is supposed to be a secure site, but the certificate that they're passing to make it secure, I can't validate. And so they normally give you a big red warning and warn you. That's definitely something you want to avoid. If, you, if, if you're seeing that, something is not right, just don't go to that site. Uh, when pop-ups pop up, don't interact with them. Uh, like I was saying earlier, they often are malicious. Uh, when you receive the most common way uh, that computers are tacked is actually through email uh, because they will send you a link, they get you to click on the link, uh, and the most common attack today is phishing. Phishing is a multi-billion dollar industry with a growth rate of about 20% a year. And it will continue on that rate, uh, if not more, uh, especially with when we have things like the pandemic, there's a lot of, lot of things going on and people will say, oh, look at this information, the latest COVID-19 information. And if you receive an email and it looks like it's from somebody or some company, and then you go look at that link, take a second, put your mouse and hover over that link, just not clicking on anything. 
it should match who, if it came from a company, it should match their domain. You should see that name in that link. If you don't, it's definitely a fake email. Uh, pay attention to where you're clicking. Take an extra second. Uh, it can save a lot of trouble because next thing you, do, you click on a site and it comes up and it looks just like Gmail or it looks just like Office 365. And you put in your username, you put in your password, and then nothing happens and you're wondering what's going on. You've now just given them your username and password. That's not good. Uh, we, we hope uh, that you have those secured with uh, more than just a password. So that, that becomes the, the other part is the security is often you've heard the term a lot, multi-factor authentication often list, listed as MFA. So just about everybody offers this and not everybody takes, takes advantage of it. We sh uh, definitely is something you want to enable and everywhere they offer. So multi-factor authentication just basically means three things. It is, it is two different, a minimum of two different forms to prove who you are. So the, the two, the two, there are three types. There is something you are, something you know, and something you have. So something you know would be your password. Something you have would be a six-digit code that changes every 30 seconds. Maybe you receive that by text or you receive that through an authentication app like Microsoft or Google's Authenticator. And the last is something you are, which is nothing more than a biometric. So that would mean your facial recognition, your thumbprint on your iPhone or your Android. <clears throat> it can even be eye uh, if you have some really good technology, but most people don't have a eye recognition. It's a pretty high tech. But the, these three things always want to use at least two of these to prove who you are. And they're only as good as you actually putting, the, putting them in place and making sure that they actually are coming to you. Um, one of, and, and one of the biggest things you, you should be concerned about is, as well as all these services, your browsers and things like this, they nowadays they all allow you to sign into them uh, to save information. But keep in mind, when you're saving those passwords into those browsers, if someone can access that device, they can then access those passwords. So make sure you, you use something like a, a service uh, like LastPass or Dashlane, where they have a secure vault with a master password so that no one can see those passwords without, being, without having that ability. And those services can also then be used with the mat so even somebody gets that master password if you use mfa on those they still have to get past that so those are you know those are where you live and breathe that, that those stuff can store your uh, chrome today chrome stores not only your passwords but will gladly store your credit card information so if they can access any of your sites like Amazon, everybody loves Amazon. Well, if they get your Amazon password and you don't have multi-factor authentication, they now have your credit card information. They can order something on Amazon and they can send it to themselves. Now you should get a notification in your email that somebody ordered something. But if you're somebody who doesn't check your email very often like my wife, maybe you missed that that day. Uh, that can be problematic. So you have to realize that where you're saving all this information out there and there's just so much of it, you have to secure it as best as possible. Wow, thank you so much for this um, overview of kind of protecting ourselves uh, with our personal computers and home internet devices. I think that was quite a few very practical tips that I think would be beneficial for everybody. Um, I would love to switch gears now and talk a little bit about how we protect ourselves when we're out of the house um, and using our mobile devices. One of the tips that, um, that I hear very often is that we should avoid the public Wi-Fi. Is, is that a good idea or not? And then if so, what other options are available to get online when we're, when we're not at home? Well, public Wi-Fi is, is probably the, the biggest bad actor out there. Um, anybody can go online, uh, look at YouTube and just search for semantic. Um, they're a very large company that makes uh, antivirus software, and they also sell a free VPN with theirs. So they're trying to sell you something. But those videos will show you, they will walk in to a regular restaurant or cafe where people are hanging out, and they're obviously on the local Wi-Fi. And they will get on the Wi-Fi as well, 
and they will start scraping all the information that goes out there. And they can literally get every keystroke you enter along the way. And they're capturing all of this information. And then they'll walk over to the person that was sitting there and they'll say, hey, I know you're this person, this person. I'd like you to see what I have here. Here's your bank account information. Here's your credit card number that you just put out here. This is what we just found. And people are always shocked. And the reason is, is when you're on public Wi-Fi, anybody's on that. And airports are one of the worst. Uh, airports are one of those where somebody will sit out there and garner all that information. And generally, uh, this is not the good time of year, but I will say there's usually at least once a month where I have to contact one of our people and make them change their password. And I ask them, were you on public Wi-Fi? And they'll say, yes, I was on an airport. And they got their password and their username by just scraping that information. Fortunately, we have multi-factor authentication required, so they did not access their accounts. But they're going to take a chance that you don't have that. And that's all they need. Um, public Wi-Fi, the best option if you have to get on it, if you don't have a choice, you can't stand your cellular network, find a VPN. Purchase a VPN, they're installable on about every mobile device as an application. There's many different ones out there. Uh, you can read reviews, pick and choose one that works for you. Uh, when you're on that VPN, all that information is, goes through a tunnel from one from you to another server. Uh, no one can see that information. It just comes out as, as encrypted gibberish to them. Um, that's the best way to see that. You know, if you're also, you know, a lot of people like to use their mobile hotspots. Uh, for when they're out and about, you know, I'm in an airport, I have a, I can use my phone as a mobile hotspot uh, to get online. That's a great idea, but keep in mind, you've got to remember to not only turn that hotspot off, change your password regularly on that hotspot. Um, all it takes is one person to figure that out. Uh, there's no way you can, unfortunately, none of these mobile devices have any way of hiding your SSID. So once you turn it on, Everybody in range can brought, see that, and they can start a trying trying to figure out your password. Not saying they will; it's highly unlikely, but it can happen. And I've met a few people where it has happened. Um, also, uh, turn off your sharing when you're on wireless. A lot of people don't realize that, but when you get on the network with somebody else, all of a sudden they can see everything you you may have sh uh, shared folders set up by default, and they can see those devices whether it's your computer or your other mobile devices. Wow, so I will definitely be avoiding the public Wi-Fi as much as I can, as much as I'm a, a fan of the free Wi-Fi, I'm understanding that's probably not the best idea. What are some other tips that you can give us for securing your mobile devices? Well, nowadays our mobile devices are more than just a phone. Uh, and they're more than just an internet browser. They're becoming our security devices with MFA, as I mentioned before. Uh, and everybody's used to getting, uh, a lot of people ch uh, opt for uh, text messaging as, as opposed to opting for an authenticator app like Microsoft or Google. Uh, I recommend the authentication apps. Yes, they are a greater hassle. There is no doubt, but that hassle is worthwhile because what people don't think about is they, everybody likes to see their text messages on their lock screen, their, their phone is locked, the text message pops up and they notice it. Nobody wants to have to turn that off. Well, the problem is if someone's, if you've been on public Wi-Fi, they now have your username and password, they try and log in somewhere and you get a notification all of a sudden pops up and you see a six digit code and you're wondering, well, that's funny, I didn't do that. You know, what you don't realize is the person sitting at the table behind you has just peered over and you weren't looking, they read that number. They now have access to your account once they have that six digit code that they've read off your phone's lock screen, they've now gone in, changed your password, turned off the MFA, and they now have full access and they've taken control of your account from you and you no longer have it. Um, it's the same thing with the uh, pattern locks. Uh, a lot of pop, that's a popular one for Android phones. Uh, the pattern lock is only as good as the person standing over their shoulder watching you use it. Uh, it's no different than when you're in a grocery store or at a gas pump where they tell you to make sure you always cover the pad when entering your pen, um, it's the same thing. If somebody's where watching it, they're going to get it from you. All they have to do is separate you from your wallet and get your card and they get your money. Same thing applies. Um, and, and probably the biggest one is, um, and I see this all the time, it's one of my biggest pet peeves, is 
people will be out in public, uh, their children are a little rowdy, and they hand them their phone, they unlock their phone, they hand it to their child just to keep them busy so that their kid's not going crazy. Get your child their own device, because what happens, and I've heard it many times, is next thing I knew, there was all these different apps on there. Oh, and they charged them up, and my, I got all these bills for apps that I didn't know I had installed on my phone. Uh, plus, you don't know what these apps are. Uh, fortunately, Apple's really good about vetting their stuff. They're mostly secure. Uh, Android is just the opposite. Uh, they're barely vetted. So uh, someone downloads the wrong app, it could easily find a way to take over and start garnering information and sending it up to a server in Russia. Uh, any of that's possible. That's exactly what happened to Target. So don't think it can happen. Um, get them their own device or let them deal without. Talk to the kids. Just don't give them your device. So as we wrap up our discussion today, what are some of the key takeaways out of everything we've talked about so far that you would really want everyone to remember about protecting themselves in our digital world? Uh, I think the biggest one is update your update all your equipment regularly. Check for firmware, check for software updates, uh, avoid public Wi-Fi uh, whenever possible. Uh, and always try and use multi-factor authentication when offered on all your devices. Uh, these are the biggest things to, and, and honestly, none of them are ever perfect by themselves. Um, rotating your passwords regularly as well. You just, unfortunately, in this, <laughs> in this today's day and age, you have to be vigilant and think like a criminal to know what they're going to do. Uh, and it changes regularly. Wow, well, you have given us so much information to think about, and I have learned a ton from our conversation today that I will definitely be um, keeping in mind and also implementing, implementing in my own home. Um, thank you again, Brad, so much for being here and sharing your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. Of course. And with that, this concludes our presentation on cyber hygiene. Thanks for joining us. And please contact your private wealth advisor if you'd like a copy of the presentation or if you have additional questions.